this piece um, came from me trying to figure out how to write about trans teenagers who have not transitioned yet, who might not know what dysphoria is, but are experiencing it. Um, it is about uh, just what you need to know for this piece is that the main character is attending the funeral of their boyfriend's father who has killed himself, so suicide is also um, a pretty big part of this piece just as a content warning. Um, the other thing you need to know is that either because of a pill that their friend has given them or their own anxiety or their own disconnect from everything that's happening, we had a narco, who knows, um, no, but uh, they are, <laughs> uh, they are feeling very, very disconnected from themselves. So, here we go. This is your first funeral, or service. Is it technically a service? You were too young to go to Aunt Anita's funeral and Grandpa Cliff's, and you've never known somebody who killed themselves before, although in the next seven years, three people you love will try to, and one of them will succeed. All the three months ago, that boy at Ethan's school jumped off one of the school buildings into the courtyard in the middle of lunch. Your mother had told you about it, how horrible that was, wasn't it? And so sad, dear. There's always another option. Suicide is never the answer. As if before he stepped off that roof into nothingness, the boy had been asking a question. You didn't like to think about it. You'll pretend to forget about it for a long time, even as it paces around in the back of your skull, a horrible thing, just like you'll pretend to forget about this. Not that you really knew Ethan's father. You knew that he was sick really sick from a lot of different things, and you met him once, a tall, smiling man who looked like an older, stretched out Ethan. So the stories people are telling are all new to you. How he wanted to be a writer, how both of his parents were terrible, how he loved James Bond novels so much that he read them to Ethan when he was little, and every time there was a sex scene, he just told Ethan that they were dancing and skipped the next couple of paragraphs. Ethan gets up to speak the first time in an hour that he has let go of you. Once it's free of his sweaty grasp, your hand immediately sneaks under the table so that you can pick the scab off your wrist. You work the dried blood off of it carefully, so carefully, and it doesn't even hurt, your fingernail digging into the ruined skin as, if, as at the microphone Ethan begins to cry, really cry, making the same gasping sobs that he did when he called you last week after collapsing in the middle of walking home from the grocery store. That was the first time you realized that the worst part of grief was how you were expecting to keep go you were expected to keep going afterwards, as if your body could still manage to pull you forward when everything was awful and empty. The strangest thing about Ethan's speech is how much love there is in it. He has been so angry at his father and his mother and you, but now here he is in front of so many people talking about the man who raised him, the man whose body he found. The man who loved him enough to read to him every night, but not enough to stay. That's how Ethan saw it, anyway, what he said to you at 3, at 3 a.m. over the phone. You didn't know how to respond to that, because you still loved your fa own father, still thought he loved you back the same. I hadn't realized yet how capable he was of hurting you, too. Your wrist is bleeding. It's bleeding a lot, actually. You look down at your hand to see your fingers covered in red rust blood, settling in the whorls of your fingerprints, a dark stain on the skirt of your dress, but not on the tablecloth. Thank God, not on the tablecloth. Ethan finishes speaking, and everyone claps. Someone else stands up to speak, but you don't hear them because Ethan is almost running back to you. He sits down so violently that you're afraid he's going to knock the table over. He doesn't reach for your hand so much as he lunges for it scoops the bloody mess out from under the table and clamps his fingers around it, tight, not noticing the tackiness of your stained skin. You make some sort of noise in protest because you'll ruin his shirt, you'll ruin the tablecloth, you'll ruin his skin if he touches you for too long, but he doesn't pay attention. You're drunk, after all. Yesterday, he kissed you for the first time. You hadn't let him before because it was going to be your first kiss, and even though you felt too old to be having your first kiss, you still wanted it to be special. He told you that his first kiss wasn't special at all, that some girl had shoved her tongue down his throat so hard that he couldn't breathe, but then he'd done the same thing to you, his tongue digging its way through your mouth like it owned the place. You breathed through your nose, let it happen. He'd been through enough, hadn't he? He deserved a kiss. His eyes were closed, but yours were open, and he's, as he did whatever he was doing to your mouth, you looked at the German shepherd standing across the street. 
In an otherwise empty yard, this dog stood still and tall, looked back at you. It barked once, as if asking the same question your mother has asked you every morning, her thumb on your chin, tilting your face upwards so that you have to look at her, not noticing that every time you just glaze your eyes over and pretend to. Are you all right? Are you all right? Are you all right? Thank you.